Hi, I'm Bernie Goliath, and I would like to show you how I came to the conclusion that Cleveland can rightfully be called the original Motor City. We know that the automobile was developed in Germany and France in the 1880s and 1890s, with Americans making only minor contributions to the technology. Many soon-to-be automotive tinkerers may have been inspired during Chicago's World's Fair in 1893, as it displayed the future of self-propelled vehicles. But when news of the 1895 Paris-Bordeaux road race reached these shores, proving that the automobile had come of age, American inventors and manufacturers scrambled to enter the market. Over the years, the title Motor City has best been associated with the city of Detroit, at least in the contemporary sense of the word. The term Motor City appears to have begun during the post-World War II period. Later, the title became more popular during the 1970s and 80s, when various articles and books were written about Detroit as the birthplace of the auto industry. Many cities such as Indianapolis, Indiana, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Buffalo, New York could also have set a claim to the title, but none could be considered the original Motor City. One city stood alone during the early pioneering days of automotive infancy. That city is Cleveland, Ohio. We are not talking about towns and municipalities that surrounded Cleveland, only the activity within the city itself. Cleveland was a vibrant industrial center during the 1870s and 80s. Cleveland led the way in transporting raw materials such as iron ore and coal through its ships along the Great Lakes, canals and vast networks of railroads. Cleveland also gained early notoriety for transforming public transportation as the first electric streetcar went into operation in 1884. By the end of the 1890s, Cleveland's population climbed to over 380,000 and ranked as the seventh largest city in the United States. By 1903, Detroit was still lagging behind as the 13th largest city in the country even after Henry Ford founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. Cleveland's industrial base was geared to making automobiles. Cleveland was a leader in steel production during the 1890s. According to the Cleveland Board of Trade, there were 147 companies in Cleveland producing iron and steel related products. The ease of transporting materials needed for steel production and the use of blast furnaces made it profitable for many of these companies. Over 14,000 were employed in steel-related business alone. By 1900, Cleveland was producing nearly 1 million tons of raw steel and iron per year and ranked fifth nationally, just falling behind places like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Chicago, Illinois. The railroads also played a role with their vast network of rail throughout the Great Lakes region, transporting materials for the city's industrial appetite. Companies such as Westinghouse, Warner and Swayze, Cleveland Automatic Machine, National Malleable and Steel Casting, American Steel and Wire, Otis Iron and Steel, Willard Storage Battery, Theodore Kuntz Company, Parrish and Bingham, Glidden Varnish and Lincoln Electric were viable suppliers of materials, parts, and machinery. Let's not forget the oil industry and its refineries. One such notable Clevelander was John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller controlled much of the oil and gas markets at the time through his Standard Oil Company of Ohio, also known as Sohio. Even though gasoline was a cheap commodity in 1901, after the Texas oil gusher Spindletop came in, the cost of gasoline dropped from $1 to a few cents per gallon. 
Some say it was Rockefeller who pushed the favor of the gasoline motor car over the steam and electric vehicle so as to maintain a steady flow of profits to his company. Needless to say, I'm sure John Dee at the time did not concern himself over the practicality of steam or electric. Electric vehicles needed to be constantly recharged and were limited in travel distance. However, it was a good car for the ladies within the city limits. The steam vehicle was a conflagratory conveyance, to say the least, and a rather challenging contraption to operate. Even to this day, with all the new technologies, electrics are still being debated as a possible alternative to fossil fuels and rather expensive to operate. Steam was efficient, but still cumbersome and never gained popularity. Being a Lake Erie port and a major railroad center, Cleveland would seem to be poised to become a leader in the automobile business. But before the automobile, it was bicycles that also helped make the difference. Bicycling was a form of social status during the 1880s and 90s, and many Cleveland firms made bicycles. Cleveland outnumbered Detroit in bicycle manufacturing three to one. By 1890, the so-called safety bicycle had replaced the old high-wheeler, starting a national craze fueled in part by women who soon realized the bicycle provided newfound independence and mobility, freeing them from the voluminous outer garments, substituting such encumbrances with the then shocking bloomers. Many pioneers who transitioned bicycle manufacturing into automobile business during the late 1890s, such as Peerless, Winton and White, were well equipped to do just that. With the city's vast supply of materials and knowledgeable workforce, the industrial base was a solid foundation to launch into automobile production. Winton led the way in Cleveland's early automobile production. He experimented with gasoline combustible engines in the basement of his Bolton Place home in 1894 and built his first motor carriage in 1895. This vehicle was uniquely equipped with the first set of tires made by the B.F. Goodrich Company and were specifically designed for his vehicle. Winton paid $400 for the molds and thus could have stimulated the idea to others that tires were an important part of the vehicle's design rather than just taking borrowed parts from wagons and bicycles. The Winton Motor Carriage Company was incorporated on March 15, 1897, and soon thereafter began producing cars in lots of 25. On April 1, 1898, Winton sold the first car of the lot to Robert Allison of Port Carbon, Pennsylvania, for $1,000 marking that transaction as the first sale of a commercially sold, mass-produced car in the country. On August 13th, he sold the 13th car to James Ward Packard of Warren, Ohio. Packard was not happy with his car and returned to the factory several times with his complaints. Winton himself went to Warren at least once to placate Packard to no avail and ended up telling Packard that if he thought he could build a better car, then he ought to do exactly that. Bear in mind that Winton probably felt he had every right to challenge Mr. Packard in view of the fact that he had driven one of his single-cylinder runabouts to New York City the previous year, accompanied by his shop superintendent. They made the trip in 78 hours and 43 minutes of actual running time over the course of 10 days. The trip garnered very little publicity, however, so Winton repeated it in 1899, this time sponsored by the Cleveland Plain Dealer and accompanied by reporter Charles B. Shanks. Leaving Cleveland on May 22, 1899, they made it to New York City in 47 hours and 34 minutes, actual running time over five days with Shanks telegraphing over 30 progress reports daily, 
to syndicated periodicals along the way. This event could pinpoint the time when the word automobile, a French term, was made popular in America. Thankfully, it's stuck in the mind of the masses as we now use it instinctively in our daily repertoire. But enough about Alexander Winton. By 1900, there were several other notable automobile makers in Cleveland, namely Baker, Peerless, Stearns, and White, making up what could be called the foremost five. Walter C. Baker founded the American Ball Bearing Company in 1895 and was producing ball bearings for electric motors and streetcars. He then formed the Baker Motor Vehicle Company in 1898. The company's first automobile was an electric buggy so small and light that it weighed only 550 pounds with motor and batteries. The first buyer was Thomas Alva Edison, the man who supplied the batteries. Baker also developed the steering knuckle for automobile front wheels, the full floating rear axle and the first rear axle bevel gear later adopted by the entire automobile industry. At one time, axles were built by Baker in Cleveland for Cadillac, Packard, Peerless, Ford, Mercer, Loiser, Pierce Arrow, and many others. The Peerless Manufacturing Company transitioned from bicycles, making 10,000 units per year, to the manufacture of transmissions and parts for the Didion Bouton motor cars. In 1900, Peerless produced a 700-pound motorette patterned after and licensed by Didion Bouton of France. It was said to have reached speeds of 25 miles per hour and achieved a distance of 30 miles with the use of only one gallon of gasoline. Frank B. Stearns built his first car in the basement of his father's home in 1896. It ran so well that his father advanced him $1,000 to build a more elaborate machine shop behind their fashionable Euclid Avenue home. Rollin White built the first white steamer in 1900 in a shop shared with his father's sewing machine business, and a year later was producing three steamers a week. All of these early motor pioneers established or enhanced their reputations by participating in organized speed competitions. In fact, if Ormond Beach, Florida, didn't claim to be the birthplace of speed, that title too could be ascribed to Cleveland. The one-mile horse track in the northeast suburb of Glenville became known as the Glenville Driving Park when automobiles began racing there as early as 1897. Winton set a record mile on the oval track on May 30th, 1897 in one minute and 47 seconds. Winton also participated in the first Gordon Bennett Cup international race, which took place from Paris to Lyons, France in June of 1900. Winton being the first American to enter into a European race was also the first casualty out of the entire field of casualties when a wheel collapsed. Fernand Charon was declared the winner, although his panhard too was a victim of mechanical ills, and he arrived at the finish so late that everyone but a handful of officials had gone home. So what lured car companies to Detroit? Was it the sound of the magic flute mesmerizing the minds of potential entrepreneurs? Or maybe the sound of cash? Tons of cash in the form of risk capital from well-to-do Detroiters. Detroit's banks were not as big as Cleveland's banks, the overall banking industry was not hip with the new self-propelled conveyance anyway. And most would predict the fad would wear off soon and leave many an institution holding an IOU. Detroit's banks, even though cautious, were more willing to take the risk in these types of ventures. The spark that could have ignited Detroit's interest in being more open to investing, lending, in the automobile business might have been the race between Henry Ford and Alexander Winton. The race was on October 10, 1901, 
in Gross Point, Michigan, and promoted as the World Champion Sweepstakes. There were four races scheduled for that day, with the featured race being a total of 25 miles with a grand prize of $1,000 plus an elegant cut glass punch bowl. The race was reduced to 10 miles due to the other three events taking longer than expected. Winton was a sure bet to win. However, in the eighth lap, Winton experienced bearing failure and Ford won the race. One month after the Gross Point race, Ford's first venture, the Detroit Automobile Company, was reorganized into the Henry Ford Company. Ford left the Henry Ford Company soon thereafter due to operational and personal differences, and that company became known as Cadillac. Ford still was not a player in the making of Detroit being the Motor City. Nevertheless, the banks were now more open and willing to lend. In June 1903, two years later, Ford started his third company, the Ford Motor Company. Ford did not produce any big numbers until he introduced the Model T in 1908. According to industry legend, Ford came to Cleveland many times and spent time with Winton. The most notable dates, 1899, when Ford asked Winton for a job, and in 1908, when Ford asked Winton for engineering assistance to help him work the bugs out of his Model T's planetary transmission prior to its introduction. By 1903, Cleveland was known as the center of the motor vehicle industry. As noted in July 25th, 1903, the automobile. Cleveland's mayor, Tom Johnson, led a procession of councilmen from Detroit, showing them the high points of Cleveland. By 1903, Cleveland had at least 30 automobile companies under its belt, and with such well-known brands as Winton, Baker, Peerless, and Stearns, which had already set up national distribution. In fact, Winton showrooms could be considered the first successful automotive dealerships beginning in Reading, Pennsylvania, and in New York City, New York, as early as 1898. Detroit's later success as the epicenter of the automobile business was most likely led by Ford. Many innovative spin-offs and the formation of General Motors attracted a creative and willing workforce from across the country, creating some labor shortages in other cities, making it a challenge to compete. Detroit's first few big names, such as Oldsmobile and Ford, subcontracted a lot of their work out. Winton, Stearns, and Peerless, on the other hand, were mostly self-sufficient and non-integrated, thereby limiting themselves to growth as Detroit became the birthing grounds for companies like Cadillac, Buick, and later the formation of General Motors. Cleveland continued to grow, building at least 80 automobile brands, through the teens and up to the last car produced by Peerless, who ceased production on November 4, 1931. Over the years, Cleveland was relied upon as a major parts supplier to Detroit. Cleveland can still boast about its rich automotive heritage. To this day, Cleveland and some of its automotive roots still survive in the lineage of companies such as Detroit Diesel, Winton Engine Company, the Molson Coors Brewing Company, Peerless Automobile Company. The title, Motor City, may have changed hands over time, but the essence and aura of Cleveland's rich and colorful automotive history lives on. <laughs>